Hi everyone and welcome to this session looking at innovation in primary care. My name is Anthony, I'm a GPST3, I'm chair of the college's AIT community and I'm your host today. This series has been created to answer some of those frequently asked questions that many of us start to list towards the end of our training. We're going to be hearing from a wide range of GPs covering all sorts of different topics, sharing their experiences and top tips. Today, we're really delighted to be joined by another brilliant GP, Dr. Stephanie Coughlin. Steph is a GP partner in Hackney in London, and she's also um, clinical lead for innovation at the Royal College of GPs. Hi, Steph. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, thanks very much for having me today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so to kick off today's session, I think a, a really good question is just what does innovation mean to you in the context of primary care? I think that's a really good question because words like innovation, I think, can sometimes come across as being more than they actually are. Whereas actually, what's an innovation? It's an idea. It's a chance to make a change, something that has a positive impact on patients, workforce, well-being. Um, and actually, anybody can uh, be an innovator. It's just about having that idea having that incentive, a reason to make a change. You, know, you may be uh, looking around at your practice thinking, actually, that, that doesn't quite work. Or, oh, if only we could do something differently, I think that would make my life much easier. I think I'd be able to work quicker. Or actually, that difficulty that, that the patient had actually wouldn't be there. So it's really just, it's a good idea. Um, and it's something that you want to change. And obviously the last few months particularly have been a huge time of change in the, well, for everybody working in healthcare, but perhaps particularly in um, primary care where we've seen lots of different innovations happening. And I know that I've seen you kind of leading across loads of different WhatsApp groups, sharing a huge number of resources um, and information for people during this crisis. What um, kind of key things have you seen that you think have been really positive during the last few months particularly? Well, I think COVID-19 has, you know, as, as I've said um, a few times before, actually is a burning platform that, that in some ways um, we needed. Um, and actually it's given the opportunity to uh, make changes quickly, um, has broken down some of the barriers to make change. And so actually if I think back to March, April time, actually what was what was absolutely amazing was across the country, GP teams, practice teams were looking at what did they need to do in order to make where they were working safe for themselves, safe for the patients um, that they were providing care for, and actually how were they going to do this? Um, so, I, so I created uh, some corona, coronavirus related WhatsApp groups of cross primary care, and actually what was phenomenal was the um, the breadth of resources that were being shared and developed by individuals, by teams, uh, by the college um, and by others um, so quickly, which covered things from uh, how, to, how to set up a, a COVID a hot hub, as we were calling them, how to um, implement remote consultations, how to use digital technologies, including things like Microsoft Teams, um, I think one of the key things was actually how to make it so that the workforce, wherever they were working, whether they were in the practice or whether they were at home, how could they feel part of the team um, and how could they or how could everyone work together? It wasn't just um, a time where we needed to create new ways of working for our patients, but actually we needed to work out how we work together ourselves as teams and how could we use uh, new ways of working, new technologies, um, to do that. Yeah, uh, I think the, you know, the WhatsApp groups were really fantastic. Uh, we kind of, um, lots of the partners in my practice were members of those WhatsApp groups and I think they all found the resources, um, you know, really helpful and that kind of sense of unity for people coming together, all going through similar challenges and problems and so freely sharing the work that they were doing um, was like, it did feel really special and, and very kind of galvanizing for everybody else to be able to go out and think about doing things differently and feel that kind of freedom to be able to kind of change things quite radically in such a short space of time as well. And what was fantastic was that 
uh, people really receptive to change at that point. And actually people, um, you know, previous uh, barriers or tensions or, or difficulties that there might have been there in the past actually were, weren't there. And people were like, well, actually, we need to make a change. We need to make this quickly. And some of the innovations within primary care were things that perhaps we would have liked to have done over the next few years. But actually, in, in a period of, of six weeks, it was a catalyst in order, in order to do that. And so actually, there are huge positives that have come um, come in terms of the way we work and obviously the pandemic is a you know has been um, devastating um, and we mustn't lose sight of that um, but actually we now need to uh, think about how we can utilize the new things that have been um, brought in and how we can make them sustainable for the future um, and actually I think it's it's really important that we embrace the positives that have come out of it uh, rather than there's always a, a tendency to want to creep back to the status quo or actually a comfort zone. Um, and I think when you're, when you're faced in a crisis, you're, you're, you're adopting and you're making the changes, but actually as we have a little bit of respite over the summer period, we really need to make sure that, that we carry on with, with, the good, with the good that's happened. And actually, it's important that innovation is not just about the things that you immediately associate that word with. It's not all about technology or AI. Actually, innovation covers a whole breadth of different topics, new ways of working, continuity of care, um, personalised care, all those sorts of things are innovations. You could think about the, the PCN DES contract and the new roles in MDT working, these are all innovations. These are all new changes. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, um, I think that's often kind of the, the not, maybe not a misconception, but whenever people often hear the word innovation, they immediately run to the idea of technology. Um, and I think that's obviously an important part of being an enabler of certain changes, but it comes down to, I guess, the, processes that you have in place and anything that's a, a change can be an innovation in its own right um, so I think that's I think that's definitely a really important thing to hold on to and you've mentioned some of those things like continuity of care person-centered care those are kind of well within the remit of some of the work that the college does I wonder if you could talk a bit more about your role as clinical lead for innovation and the role more broadly of the college in the innovation space in primary care Yes, I think um, championing innovation in primary care is incredibly important. Um, we know that sometimes in the NHS, um, uh, not, not intentionally, but sometimes there can be a focus in terms of innovations and, and new ways um, in acute and secondary care. And actually the role of the college is to champion, um, champion new ways of working and new ways of doing things within primary care. And also... Um, thinking about quality you can have a really great idea um, but it doesn't quite work because you don't implement it quite in the right way or you can have a you know a pretty good idea but a pretty good idea that's implemented well um, can make such huge impact and have fantastic change so i think it's um one of the, the key things that the college does is um, looks, looks, at, looks out there, looks at the horizon, looks to see what um, innovations there are that are relevant to primary care, what works, um, what needs to, uh, what is suitable um, for uh, our members and our GP practices to think about implementing themselves, and then what support might people need in order to implement that. Implementation is the key. Um, I know, and another key thing I think we don't give enough importance to is actually shared value, shared vision. So actually, how do you bring people with you? We know that um, if you're trying to make a change, I'm sure you can think of a time that you were frustrated by something um, where you were working and actually wanted to change it, whether that's as a foundation doctor or on your GP training schemes. But actually, to do that just by yourself is really difficult. Um, and actually you need a team, you need people, you need to bring people with you in order to do that. And how you do that is by working out what do you value, what's important here to change, um, and what's your vision, what do you see the end being, what do you think success look like, and do people agree with, with what with what you think works? Um, so really these are key things, and they're the... Um, you know, key things that the college are committed to. So working out what works, 
what um what pressure do we need to apply or what canvassing or lobbying sometimes people might call it to um, other stakeholders thinking about NHS England, the government, public health, all those sorts of um, bodies to say actually we think this this looks really good and actually we think we could do something um, really amazing with this. Um, um, but then also supporting uh, practices on the ground because we know that making change is can be difficult because when you're swamped with the day-to-day -day work, creating that time and that space and that energy, that headspace, um, in order to be able to think about making change can feel quite overwhelming when actually you're looking and you're like, oh my goodness, I've got this many patients to get through blood tests, documents, administ you know, admin work, but actually creating that headspace and, and that time. And that, that's where the college can support, um, uh, support practices in doing that. And for kind of you in your role, is there what kind of is a, a kind of typical month or or few weeks in, in your role at the minute? I guess it's been a time of huge change of everything that's happening with COVID. Um, but what kind of are the key things that you've kind of been able to contribute to or, or have coming up on in the future as well? I think what's what's fantastic about primary care and being the uh, clinical lead for innovation here at the college is the breadth of things that I'm involved with. No day is ever the same. Um, one of the projects that we're working on at the moment, um, one of them is around digital therapeutics. So what does that mean? That's thinking about um, apps often around wellness, so things that you might be aware of, things like Sleepio, Headspace, um, and actually looking at um, how do we support GP practices to signpost effectively to um, to these sorts of um, apps that that they themselves, their teams, and their patients can access? And how do we know that they're they're good quality? Um, how do we know that? Um, I think the first and most important thing they're not going to do any harm. Um, and then how do and how do we work out which ones have a, a good evidence base? Um, you know, re remembering that. Um, evidence uh, in some research areas and innovation can be slightly different. We're not necessarily talking about randomized controlled trials, but actually what are the rapid test and learn cycles? What are the ways that we can evaluate innovations quickly um, and determine whether they are, they are going to work and be effective so actually we can then uh, move forwards with them or actually decide, actually, I don't think this is going to be quite work, quite work, so let's not invest the time in that but move to something else. So I think that's a really exciting thing. I think it's an area that um, many GPs and primary care teams don't know much about. Um, so that's a really exciting thing that we're working on at the moment, um, putting together some training materials for uh, primary care teams on how they can utilise these, um, these sort of therapeutic interventions um, effectively and safely. Um, other things that we're working on um, around continuity of care and personalised care that we've talked about um, already. And I think the key thing here is what COVID has brought is brought remote consultations. Um, and actually, we need to be really cautious that the way we consult and the way we um, communicate with our, our patients and their families and their carers uh, isn't, doesn't become transactional. And we don't regress to it becoming quite doctor-centred or doctor-focused. So we need to remember that we hear the, hear the voice of the patient and that their voice is at the heart, their carers and their families. And then the other thing is not forgetting the, the, the huge benefits that continuity of care brings um, into, you know, if you, if you imagine you're a new GP in a practice and you're coming in and just having to start with remote consultations, actually that's really hard. Um, whereas if you're more established and have been there for a, a period of time, actually the trust and the relationships and the confidence you, that patients have in you from, from that continuity is invaluable. So actually we're working with the Health Foundation um, around continuity of care and supporting with a number of pilot sites across the country that are looking at different ways of doing uh, continuity of care. One is around micro teams, so actually how do you create continuity across teams? Others is a, around that single relationship based um, continuity and how do you use di digital um, interventions, things like eConsult, things like Ask My GP, Egton's version, um, you know, in, in the mix with that. 
Um, and uh, you know, I think those are two of the uh, really exciting projects we're working at the moment. And uh, working for the college is really interesting. Um, you get to understand uh, you know, the sort of landscape um, nationally, across the country, what, um, what uh, some areas may be trying to launch or trying to kick off. And then I think you know, that it gives you that sort of overview. Um, and also as, a, as a, a clinician or practitioner, actually you're able to give that sort of objective opinions and um, utilizing your on the, on the ground um, experience of what it's like in reality. Um, and I think that's really crucial and, and you know, being clinically led and, and clinically focused, I think, is one of the real um, assets of the college. Mm. Yeah, definitely. I think that's been kind of one of my big takeaways from any work that I've done at the college is just that it's actually really helped me to better get a sense of what's happening around the country to feel more um, in tune and have a better understanding of um, you know very, any kind of different um, aspects of primary care that's ongoing and how that can be influenced by an organization like the college so it's good to hear that at a time of so much change you've you know you've, you've been involved be able to be involved in so many really interesting projects um, which can continue to help deliver benefits to primary care as well within all of that kind of change um, I imagine that you know we, there's lots of different barriers to innovation, um, and I guess you've, we kind of mentioned that during the last few months, actually people have felt a bit more freedom to do things differently. There's been maybe a slight change in the culture of innovation. What are the other kind of perhaps common barriers that you come across to innovations not necessarily succeeding? Um, so I've talked to I mentioned a couple already. One is time and having that headspace to be able to make change. Um, the other is around values and vision and making sure you get that from the beginning. If you don't have that, you'll often come unstuck later down the line. Um, consult widely. Um, often innovators, the, the best innovators, they come up with a good idea, but actually they test that with other people from a whole breadth of different experiences. So actually the barriers that if, if you're, not asking the questions to the right people and different people and people who have a different opinion to yourself and actually welcoming that constructive challenge. Um, without doing that, that can be um, a barrier. Another barrier sometimes be how often you ask the question, how are you going to evaluate this? Um, so actually, what questions do you want to answer? What does success look like? How might you evaluate what you've done? Because often people test um, an idea and innovation on a very small scale, but with the hope that they will be able to roll this out wider. So actually thinking about how am I going to demonstrate benefit from this? That may be through qualitative, so asking questions, doing focused interviews. That may be thinking about um, outputs, so thinking about sort of processes actually, you know, as an example, um, you might um, count or, or, or collate up numbers of times someone con consults. That's just as an example, if you introduce an intervention with the aim to, to produce um, sort of holistic care. And then the other aspect around evaluating is what, what outcomes do you want? You know, we, we, we must in, um, be driven by an outcomes focused uh, innovation. You want to demonstrate benefit. Um, to, which, to whichever group you're looking at, that may be your workforce, your own team, that may be your patients, that may be other trainees. Um, and actually you need to think about these things from the beginning because actually if you don't, um, then that can become a barrier to a rollout. Um, and when you have your idea thinking about, well, this is really, this is important to me. Do I think this will be important to somebody else? So actually asking all these questions from the beginning, asking questions and questions, um, because otherwise you can get kind of so far da down the line that um, you know, you're kind of emotionally attached to something. You're like, I've got to see this through, I've got to see this through. Whereas actually, um, you know, others, others may be looking from the outside and thinking, actually, I think we need to change this or we need to do something slightly different to make it, su to make it um, successful. And then the other barrier is around implementation, I think. So not, thinking already from the beginning, how might I implement this? What 
help or support or what might be the tricky bits around uh, implementing my idea um, and that may, may be around um, I haven't got buy-in from other people that may be around actually I'm not sure if this is an interest area or it may be around um, you know thinking around the, the steps that you need in order to make the idea work um, how are you going to bring people with you um, what are those glitches those process things that you need to get through so actually thinking about these things from the beginning mm -hmm. yeah it's it's um it's it's perhaps not surprising but really interesting that through a few of these conversations i keep thinking back to one that we've done on um working at scale which is in and of itself an innovation and um and i think there during the conversation many of the kind of challenges um feel quite similar in some ways so uh, and also the ways to kind of succeed so again there was a lot of conversation there around the importance of relationships of shared purpose and vision and particularly when you're kind of working at scale across broad teams it's really important it was clear that it was really important to be able to kind of unify teams and especially when you're working with kind of maybe distributed teams across a number of different sites so it's um yeah i think it's i think it's really interesting just how kind of everything comes back to these kind of really really key principles for succeeding with any kind of change or innovation um, no matter what scale that might be at and it's important to remember that making change or implementing innovations actually usually about one in three so about 30 percent are successful um, and actually don't feel disheartened if something doesn't work mm -hmm. um, and actually, it's about how you how you respond to that, and actually thinking about well, that didn't quite work. What um, what could I do differently next time? Um, and actually, not you know, if if something doesn't quite work, um, often some tweaks or or thinking again, going back to that those relationships, values, vision, culture. Um, you know, they are your key things to making something successful. As I said, you can have a brilliant idea, but without those, it's not going to go anywhere. Whereas a good idea with great implementation, massive success. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, yeah, a piece of advice that definitely still doesn't get said enough is not being afraid of failure and recognizing that actually a lot of ideas don't necessarily go the full distance the first time around. And actually there's so much learning that can come from something which might not necessarily end up being successful, but you might be able to use that learning in a completely different way or on a project with just a few tweaks in the future as well. And actually innovations, um, Innovations don't have to be big things. Small things can have huge impact. Um, and actually, when we talk about an innovation, um, it's not about a wide scale digital implementation of a big digital thing. Actually, it could be making one very small change in the practice in which you work that actually just has huge impact. And yeah, um, uh, things not working, things not working out. I mean, I don't like to use the word failure, but things not being successful and actually what you learn from that then drives you gives you the motivation gives you that learning if we if we were all successful at everything that we did we wouldn't learn actually i think you learn the most from when things don't go well and actually reflecting on that and thinking oh that didn't go that didn't go well and you know if i think in my uh, in my roles that happens all the time mm -hmm. um, but actually it's thinking well well what would i do next time and 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 how would i change it um, and ask people what they think um, if you're doing if you're presenting something or doing a pitch i think about some of the work we've done at the college in supporting mgp um, entrepreneurs um, over the past couple of years actually um, Finding somebody, uh, a mentor, can be really helpful. And practice. Um, you know, people use the word fake it until you make it. Actually, if you're doing a pitch for something, practice. It's a performance. Um, and actually utilizing those skills, finding people in your area or where you work who are also interested in, in change management or doing new things. You know, yeah, can I shadow you? Uh, can I look at what you do? Um, can I come and see the work that you're doing? Obviously, um, at the moment it's a bit more challenging, but actually we're all adapting to the virtual way. Um, and actually practice. If I think, you know, if you're coming to do a, a presentation or doing a, a pitch to somebody, you, you, you work on it beforehand, you practice, you give it a go, you know, you get a teddy in front of you and you, uh, you know, you, you do it uh, or do it to you know, a friend or family and actually that's how um, 
uh, you know, practice um, gives experience. Yeah, definitely. I, I think that's so, so many really, really useful bits of uh, kind of knowledge or tips for people. Do you, we've, you've already shared so much, but have you got any other kind of key takeaways that if someone has an idea that something they'd like to to try and work on, how they can take that from an idea to a reality, if you have any other kind of top tips for, for yeah. someone that's just thinking yeah. about how they can do that? I think that's a really good question and it's one I often think about. I think start small. Um, start small and see where that gets you. There's always going to be people who are resistant to change. So find the people who are often talk about, use a phrase of early adopters. So who are the people um, that you work with either in your own practice, a neighboring practice, another part of the locality where you work, who, you know, if there's something uh, new that's being adopted, they're always putting their hands up saying, yeah, we'll give it a go. Or yes, we'll try that. So actually find people who, um, you think will be receptive to change to start with. Um, look for open doors already. Look for easy ways to get to bring people on board. There's always going to be people who are more resistant. Um, and if you start with them, you're going to feel like it's an uphill battle. So find your early adopters, find people who are like-minded to you and also want to make a change or someone who's particularly frustrated, it might be a healthcare assistant or a nurse or one of the reception team, um, who are also finding something frustrating. Work with different people. Work with people who are coming from a different perspective, a different role, that can be really helpful to challenge your thinking in a really positive way. You can't do it alone. You really need other people with you um, in order to have maximum um, impact and benefit. Um, Shared values, shared vision. Um, find something you're passionate about. Um, find something you're interested in. Uh, and actually that really helps um, to uh, drive, the, you know, drive the innovation forwards. You know, and, and don't be afraid to have something go wrong. Test it, try it, but identify quickly. If something isn't working, recognize that quickly and make a change. Don't carry on with something because you feel you have to. Actually, um, the most successful and the best innovators quickly realise something isn't working and change. Um, I think they're my um, uh, top tips. And uh, get involved, get stuck in and give it a go. Yeah, I, I mean, really fantastic. Thank you, Steph, for sharing that. I think really invaluable advice for anyone who, who you know, is in that position. And I think that's something that's really applicable to everyone who's just kind of approaching that transition to the, taking on their roles post-CCT, but also to trainees as well. Um, I think those are all really top tips for people that are just starting to kind of get involved in change or think about um, things they might like to see done differently in their practice or local area. Um, Final question, as, as clinical lead for innovation, if, if you can, is there one thing that you see on the horizon, one change or new way of doing things that you're really most excited about or keen to see how it develops over the coming months or years? So obviously we've had a, a revolution in remote consultations and I think that will, will continue. I think for me, the the one of the really exciting things is how we utilize things like remote monitoring and how we utilize um, things like telemedicine, some might call it, but actually how do we keep the patient at the heart of that? So actually how do we hear from our patients, our residents, our carers and, and family members, actually what's important to them and what will make their life easier um, in this sphere and different. So actually, will being able to do their own uh, blood pressure monitoring um, or will being able to um, record some of their own long-term condition parameters, how will that, how can we utilize something like that to then support them to feel self-empowered, to take care of themselves? Um, but I think also being absolutely mindful of the inequalities and actually, whenever you identify an innovation, the question you always, always have to ask is, is this going to widen health inequalities? Is there something in what we're implementing that we can utilise in order to um, reduce those health inequalities? And I think 
COVID has absolutely shone a light on that. Um, and as we think about the innovations um, in remote monitoring and telemedicine, we need to be mindful of um, social deprivation, language barriers, learning disabilities, and other sorts of, um, of, of population groups that really need a tailored approach. So I'm excited um, about how we can utilize some of the technologies to make uh, our patients' lives easier um, not to make our own lives easier, to make their lives easier um, and support them with self-empowerment of their own conditions. But caveated in that, I always have my, um, you know, have that inequalities lens there um, and how we can make sure that the, as far as possible, that the innovations that we're introducing um, absolutely get to um, those uh, patient groups that really need them the most um, and how can we support them uh, with their carers um, and, and relatives to do that um, so that they can um, access uh, healthcare more easily. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much again, Steph, for speaking so openly and passionately about um, your experiences as clinical lead, about the role of the college in innovation and in what is um, like you say, whilst has been a really devastating time with the pandemic, is also an exciting time of potential and, and opportunity. Um, and hopefully we can see lots more benefits delivered over the coming months. And personal thanks for all you've done, helping to share some of the resources and learning during what's been a really difficult time for many of us working across the healthcare sector. Great. Thanks very much for having me. It's been a real pleasure talking you, to you today. Thanks a lot. And thanks everybody for tuning in. And we'll see you, see you again for the next edition soon.